Good afternoon, everyone. Oh. Excellent. It's being recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. A very warm welcome on a very rainy day to today's webinar. Um, what I wish I'd known, HR directors, so a fascinating subject. I can see the numbers climbing, so I know it's a popular topic. Welcome to everybody. My name is Leah De Silva. I'll be taking you through today's session. Um, I'm a senior program manager within the CIPD Trust. Um, don't worry if you don't know much about the CIPD Trust, I'll tell you a little bit more at the end of the session. Um, but today we're, we're delighted to have a stellar panel of experts to guide us through today's topic. Thankfully, we don't have to build our own time machine or steal a DeLorean. We don't have to go back in time. The benefit of hindsight will be provided for us through our expert panelists who have practical experience, hints, tips, learning and insight to share in abundance. Now, the way we're going to do things today um, with our panel is I'll be inviting each of our speakers in turn to take us through their own practical experience, their personal journeys to leadership and their experience in these areas. Um, and once we've done that, I will be opening up the floor to questions. So we hope to pepper our panelists with lots of fantastic questions from the audience. So do feel free whilst you're listening to them to pop your questions in the q a i'm conscious there's a lot of us on the call today so i'll try to get to as many as i can um, and certainly group together some of the themes to ensure a lively and rich discussion um, before the end of today and i will give a more thorough introduction to our panelists each time they unmute to to do that but for now a warm welcome to david clutterbuck sarah mason and olukemi chiboda who are giving up their lunch time to give us plenty of food for thought i think and that that will be the end of my food related puns. Um, but before we get going, I just wanted to call out some of the key benefits that CIPD members have access to. I won't read them all out because you can see them clearly on the screen. Um, but I think it's worth saying in these times, these uncertain times, there's times of difficulty that, that everyone is facing. You don't have to face it alone. There are lots of things out there that we provide that can support you, whether it's leaning on your communities through the CIPD community, getting involved in local branch activity with other people professionals. Do make use of these. And particularly at the moment, I think financial support and, and the new wellbeing helpline and resources is a great way to do that. It's open to all our members in UK and Ireland, and it's certainly worth availing yourself of these resources if it's something that you or someone else you know needs. So do do that. Um, but in a moment, I'm going to crack on with today's hot topic. And it is certainly hot because I see the numbers still rising. So you're all very welcome if you're just joining us now. Um, I guess our first panelist probably doesn't need an introduction. Um, you'll definitely be familiar with David Clutterbuck and certainly his work, but I'm going to give him an introduction anyway, because I think it's absolutely worthy of it. Um, for those of you who don't know David, David is one of the earlier pioneers of developmental coaching and mentoring. He's also the co-founder of the European Mentoring and Coaching Council. I mean, at last count, he'd authored more than 70 books. I suspect it's closer to 75 now um, around sort of coaching culture and team coaching. Um, and without giving away his age, I think that's more than one a year. So pretty impressive um, for us to see. He's also a visiting professor at four business schools um, and he leads a global network of specialist mentoring and coaching training consultants. As well as that, if he didn't have enough to do, um, I'm delighted that we've been able to work with David for the last three years in, in developing and designing the aspiring HRD mentoring program here at the CIPD. For those of you who don't know that program or aren't familiar with it, what it does is it's, it's a lever to drive greater diversity at the senior levels of the people profession. Um, and it connects existing leaders with people aspiring to that role in the next two to three years um, in a mentoring relationship for about a year. And David's involvement is to run the learning interactions that those mentees go through during that process, covering topics you'd expect to see, you know, imposter syndrome through to all the things we're going to unpick today. Um, but as well as being a critical friend and, and companion to the CIPD, I think David has, has taken it upon himself to, to ask this, this burning question for a group of suspecting or unsuspecting HRDs over the last year or two to really get to the nub of what they wish they'd known before they became an HR director. So I think our job today is to try and bust some of those myths and explain some of the, the key things that some of our um, delegates and colleagues found during that transition. So that's enough from me, I think. I'm going to invite David to, to unmute. He's got a few slides to accompany this and share some of the learnings and insights from that research. David, over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Leah. And yes, it is 75 books for my 75th birthday. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure how I've managed that, but somehow it's it, it, it sort of happened. Um, it's been great working um, with the CIPD on the Aspiring HR Directors Programme and a previous uh, um, um, pilot of that was a few years before. Um, uh, this one being virtual and the other one being, um, I, I think it was face to face, I think it was a long time ago. Um, but we, um, but it's certainly been an issue for us to, to, to explore um, the sharing of knowledge between, between the two, between a mentor who's somebody who's been there for a long, in the process for a long time, um, and somebody who's, who's just, who's, who's, who's aspiring, who wants to get there. Um, and I'm drawn back to probably 25 years to my first experience of, of <clears throat> finding a mentor for a newly appointed or, or um, an, an H, uh, sorry, an HRD in a, in a large organization um, who wanted to get onto the board, but everybody else was male. And of, and they, you know, of a similar age and similar background. Um, and what, what we did in the end was to find her another, a chief executive in that particular case to work with as her mentor. Um, and it was another woman who, who, who um, um, also from an HR background, but who made those, that, that transition um, both to HR director and, and to, to, to CEO. Uh, and then when she became the HRD um, in that organization, she said, thank you to that relationship. But then she asked for another one. Um, but this time she went and found herself, um, it didn't really matter to her what gender that the, the person, the, that the mentor was because she needed a role model at that first time but now she just wanted somebody who'd been there and seen it and done it all and so let's let's move it let's start working at, 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 at the uh, at the slides here so with this this subject of liminality the, st the, the state of being in between one state and another we're, we're all in, in in liminality all the time we just don't often recognize it um and it's really helpful for um any HR professional to stop and think from time to time, what's the transition <clears throat> I'm making? What, who's the person that I was and who's the person I'm becoming? You know, is that the person I want to be? Um, and just that reflection helps us to ground what we're doing and, to, and, to, and, to, and to, to get a sense of greater intentionality and purpose in the growth that we have as a professional. Um, so it's, it's important to reflect. It's important to think about where am I? How did I get here? And one of the tools and techniques that we've we've shared with the uh, with, with uh, the, the latest cohort uh, just earlier this this week um, was a technique called career pathing, where you look back at your career so far and you say, every critical point in my career, what happened? What can I learn from going back to that? Who helped me with my thinking about making my choices? And so <clears throat> this whole process um, and, the, and the Aspiring HR Directors Programme, uh, and please let's have the next slide, um, are all built upon the, the, the idea that we need somebody to help us to reflect um, on what we need to do. So the survey that we did <coughs> um, was inspired by the fact that um, we were individually getting lots of lots of wonderful relationships, and, and Leah will tell you tell you more about the, the program and all the success of the program. But it has been brilliantly successful in helping aspiring HR directors move on in their careers towards becoming HRDs. And but each of the sharings that were happening were individual. We didn't really have a big picture of what does it take to move from being an HR senior HR functionary to being a, um, an HR director. Um, were there some patterns that we could identify? So that's what we set out <clears throat> to include. So we, um, uh, we, we, I approached Leah and said, "Look, let's 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 approach people in in uh, in, in in the CIPD. I used to use use my networks, and um, we also got some help from ARI, the Association of Human Resources um, uh, Institute in in Australia, <clears throat> and that that gave us um, fifty five HRDs responded in a, to a detailed questionnaire." Um, and they gave us a, a lot of information, um, and so pretty much Europe and, 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 and Asia Pacific were the key were the key areas that we got this from. So you could say this may be different from in the states, and that may be so. But in, for, for for our audience here, 
you know, this, this the, what we've got is actually relating to us and to, to our experience here in Europe and the, particularly the UK and in, in Australia, particularly in, uh, in, in, in Asia Pacific. So let's look at the next slide, please. So <clears throat> what came out of this were 14 critical themes. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through and say a little bit about each one of them. This, you're going to get the report itself anyway. Um, so um, you could, uh, if, if you wish it, um, Lair will tell you more about that later. Um, but just take, taking them one by one, the kind of examples. So what it means to be a director legally. So actually having that, that understanding of, of, of the role of a director in law. So many uh, people with what we, we find become, become directors, not recognizing that actually they've taken on a bunch of responsibilities, not just for their own function, but for the, for the, the viability of the company as a whole or the organization as a whole. It's a big shift. Um, and um, uh, some of the things that people said, you're there to be a, there, you're there for a reason, to be an advisor and to make decisions. Um, and to make decisions with much less information than you would thought you would have needed. Um, um, you, um, it, it seems obvious, but but um, but but when sitting with a top team, making sure that the discussions around the benefits to staff are, think, are, are, are actually talked about in decision making. Um, that's a key part of the role. And and um, um, and then I have the comment. Others around the table will eventually follow suit and start to think like this. So there's a key role here in terms of the role of a director in educating the rest of the board. Um, um, and that could be, as, as, as I'm sure many of you will, will know from your own experience, that could be quite difficult. Um, then on the breadth of responsibility and the knowledge of the business overall, absolutely essential for every HRD to be literate in finance. Um, to be able to use numbers, and that's not just through um, HR analytics. Nobody, nobody believes our HR analytics anyway. Um, um, they've often been described as HR banalytics because they have uh, rather than analytics. But never mind. Uh, but but actually being able to hold your own in a financial discussion. And one of the questions I love to ask of of, of, um, uh, of people on on, on boards is, um, could you actually go and give a speech for the finance director? Um, um, and step in from them because they, if they if they were not not available. And similarly, of course, the same with the finance director. Could you give a speech on behalf of AR, IHR rather? Um, fascinating way of looking at things. Um, perspectives on leadership and behaviour. Um, um, uh, one person said, "Sadly, I didn't get honest feedback from my new team, and I didn't know, and I didn't open up and up the door enough to get feedback to flow. Real personal examples here. Loads of these." Um, I thought I was I was thinking like a senior like a like a CEO. Um, now I know I wasn't. Uh, wonderful comments. Roles relating to other directors. Um, line managers always think that they more about know more about HR than we do. And it's only and basically this this person says it's only when they stuff up um, 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 and, and ask for help that we should be intervening, <laughs> which is an interesting point of view. Um, uh, and, and, and there's loads more like this. Um, I, I, I would have loved to have known how hard it is for the HRD to achieve recognition and support from other areas of business. Um, uh, and then how we add value. Um, you're evaluated on the business contribution, not on, on the professional contribution of HR. Um, um, you need to be commercial. Then managing the legacy. Um, um, you don't get until you actually get to a board to, to be part of the board. You don't un understand the history behind how decisions were made. Um, and this came out as a very strong theme that people that, that if you can actually work out the narrative, the things that are the, 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 the in camera stuff that's happened before you got there, it's really helpful in, in being able to contribute right from the beginning. Education in the organization, you have to think like an executive to, um, to, to, to find the right HR solutions. Um, but, and you have to build trust in order for them to be able to listen to you so that they, so that they could begin to take a people perspective along with the numbers perspective. Politics, well, you know, politics is everywhere, um, but um, many HR um, professionals in, in, in my experience are politically naive. Um, and uh, you have to learn pretty fast 
to be a political operator. Now, <clears throat> when we're working with politics, we talk about thinking politically, acting with authenticity. Learning the skills to do that, they seem to be vital. The, the general uh, skills and knowledge that, 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 uh, um, um, that you have, uh, that's, that's a, another whole area. Um, adapting your communication style for the C-suite. Um, moving from, the, from, 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 um, uh, from tactics to strategy, taking that longer term perspective. It's so much easier. We, so, we, in, 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 as an HR function, it's so much easier. We, we're focused on, on this new program we're trying to introduce. We've got to, we, we've got, we've got to tackle this particular problem with the DNI. But stepping back and seeing it from a much longer term perspective um, and communicating that to the rest of the board. Um, the, the whole issue of connectedness um, um, is one as well. Um, you've got to develop relationships, say the respondents, at all levels in the organization. It's no good just developing them with your other directors or within your own department. You've got to have fingers everywhere. Um, uh, and um, on, on terms of, I missed out, the behavior of the key, key players, the role of HR as the moral compass. Underemphasized, but seem, but, but, but some of our correspondents said this is vital to be clear about your role as the, if you like, the conscience of the organization, but not the person that, con that all the problems gets dumped on, the person that enables the organization to access its own values and to live its own values. Um, uh, wonderful comment here on the uh, connectedness. Don't let anybody lead you on as to who's best to connect with based on their mired view of the organization or an office politics. Um, connect with everybody in the organization to build lasting relationships. It's a lovely comment. Um, <clears throat> doing less to achieve more. Yeah, stop trying so hard and believe more, more in myself and others. Great comment. Um, reallocate your time and energy. Um, moving away from the way you used to carry out your role to what you need in the new role. Um, on, and coaching and mentoring, so many comments about the value of having a coach and a, or a mentor to help you through the transition and beyond. Um, it, it, I think um, in my experience, HR, well, I don't, from the comments that we had to, HR, there's a, well, a, here's a lovely comment. There seems to be a business assumption that HRD doesn't need coaching uh, due to the perception that HR takes care of everything. Actually, HR needs coaching just as much, if not more than anybody else, because we've got to fight all the politics in the organization. And, and work-life balance, <clears throat> the last one, so easy for the new job to take over your life. So before you get into it, our correspondents were saying, think about how you're going to retain a life and the balance that you have there. So those are the, th the 14 themes that came out. Um, I think they're fascinating, uh, and I hope you, you do too. And if we just look, put up the last, last slide there, some of the questions it raises for us, <clears throat> what does this mean for, for, for the education that we have for, 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 for HR? As far as I know, this is really the only major program in CIPD that really helps HR professionals think about becoming HR directors. Um, we need, what are we doing to do, need to do differently? How can we expand what we're doing here? This is a limited program, um, uh, but it's been incredibly beneficial for people. And then there's the transition as well from HRD to chief executive. Doesn't happen that often, but when it does, it changes the nature of an organization. So there's a very brief summary of the research. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, David. That was hugely helpful. Um, lots of insight there and lots of things that are prompting lots of questions from our audience. So we'll come to as many of those as we can later. I feel sure politics will be up there front and centre. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our next panellist. Um, Sarah Mason joins us today. She's the former Chief People Officer of Foxton's, London's leading estate agency. Her background includes a wide range of HR roles focused on improving the performance of organisations through good people practice. So she started life as a specialist before becoming more of a generalist. She's also a chartered fellow of the CIPD and a very active member of the HR community. Um, she's had a focus on business psychology throughout her career with an evidence-based approach to her work. And she's previously been a board member of the Association of Business Psychology itself. And if that wasn't enough, um, we've been delighted to have her as a mentor in the aspiring HRD program for the last couple of years. Um, and we'll be calling on her to do so again in the future, I, I don't doubt. Um, but I invite Sarah to, to talk us through you know, your journey to leadership and some of the insights you'd like to share. 
Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, firstly, I wanted to say thank you for all the people who inputted into the research because it was really insightful. I've read through, you know, the, the information in the paper and there's so much there in terms of the different themes and how they landed with me. And I think I really wish I had had that 10, 10, 15 years ago, as I was moving into leadership roles, it had been hugely helpful. One of those themes that came through and loneliness at the top a little bit. No one does really tell you some of this stuff. So I think there's some great insight in there. Um, I think it's really valuable. So thank you to everyone who inputted into the research. There's like a hive mind of wisdom there that I really benefited personally from, I thought was really useful. Um, and to, to go in back into the introduction piece, I have moved. My leadership journey was starting off um, as a specialist. So having heads of roles in learning and development and recruitment over time into a generalist HRD and that transition itself taught me quite a lot actually so to share a few bits of that up front moving from a specialist to a generalist role first of all taught me that the role of an HRD has a huge amount of risk involved and no one really says that to you that's never really mentioned that you're going to suddenly need to have very broad shoulders, there's a lot of, of burden that's going to be placed on you around the risk, particularly reputational risk, you've got tribunals in there. And that's something that for the first half of my career, you know, really enjoying the L&D and recruitment side of it was less exposed to. Suddenly, there's a lot that can go wrong on your watch and it is your neck on the line. So this transition into the generalist HRD role taught me a lot about risk and not being scared of it. You can never really avoid it. If you avoid risk fully, then you're not making commercial opportunities, but managing it, mitigating it in a way that seems appropriate given the, con the contextual situation you're in. So that transition from specialist to generalist taught me a lot about risk, some sleepless nights on that one, learnt, learnt to navigate that. Secondly, that piece around a broader remit, going from a specialist to suddenly owning all of the HR piece, doesn't always come with a broader budget. Unfortunately, you suddenly have lots more to do but not necessarily lots more resource so there's a piece there about being you know brutally um prioritizing prioritizing what you're doing you've got to be pretty um incisive around what you spend your time and resources on which i thought was something that i hadn't really experienced before going into the hrd role and finally that transition across from a specialist to a generalist for all the specialists who are listening um when you go into an hrd role you become the keeper of secrets you know you've got the keys to the safe suddenly all the stuff that's sensitive and commercially tricky is is in your remit and it takes a really deft pair of hands to handle that it's suddenly fairly tricky to navigate some of that so I had suddenly access my first HRD role to lots of information, lots of things that needed to be managed in a certain way which I hadn't been exposed to before and that can be um, quite a lot for someone to take on in their first role but again the purpose of the CIPD, the purpose of uh, a community is to be able to reach out and know who to go to and you've got to be fairly careful when, when you do that with commercial information. So that was my transition from a specialist leader into a generalist leader and then I wanted to go through a couple of the points from the research and when I, I was chat chatting before in preparation for this call the question was which parts of the research landed with you and actually the answer is all of them there wasn't a single bit there that I didn't go yep 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 that all that all lands with me all of that is I've experienced all of it so I totally think the, the research is very valuable but I've just picked out three bits otherwise I'll take up all of Olu Kemi's time and that's not fair um, and I'll go on and on. So three bits I wanted to pick up on, three of the themes um, to kind of talk about how they resonated with me. The first one was thinking like a director. I think that's so important and that covers, a, as David explained, quite a, a broad church. You've got certainly finance, understanding a PL, understanding how businesses run, the different roles at the top team and how you will influence them, understanding your industry. I spent the last four years in a state agency and every day I'd make sure I was learning news about the industry, what was happening. You know, I'm not an estate agent by trade and never been one, but I've got to understand that in depth so I can understand how the business runs. So understanding that the business and the industry you're in Governance is really important as well, and um, more so um, the more corporate or PLC environment you're in, understanding you know, the Companies Act and the UK Corporate Governance Code, stuff that you may not really care about right now does become a bit more important um, as a, an HRD and a PLC, so understanding some governance. So thinking like a director involves some kind of weighty stuff because you're now culpable, as David said, so you need to know what you're culpable for and be good at it. That's really important. But secondly, there's a piece there for me around thinking like an employer, not an employee. 
and people don't I've seen people as HRDs who never make this shift actually I've seen a number of HRDs over the years who think like employees they they um, prioritize the projects that benefit them personally um, or their team you know I'm talking about working conditions maybe benefits and that's something that you need to avoid really quickly you've got to get into the employer mindset super quickly what works for the organization um, is really important and it's quite easy to think of yourself as an employee but as an HR director you're suddenly this employer and you need to think about that. I worked in one organisation years ago where there was lots of grumblings around the HR team at the time, I was a specialist back then so I may have been part of those grumblings whereby it was very much around well if HR are the watchmen who watches the watchmen, who is keeping them accountable and here's the thing your business, your employees and your board will keep you accountable, there's nowhere to hide so you've got to hold yourself to a really high standard because you're very visible and you can't be that HR team that rewards itself or does things for them you've got to be super mindful of that so that was the first thing you've got to be careful of who watches you so thinking like a director the second point for me was around politics I think it's really close to my heart because it's something I wasn't great at the first part of my career I was politically naive and realized that wasn't going to get me very far actually um, and it would it, I was would suddenly struggle thinking how have all these decisions been made without me it's because I wasn't reading the politics very well so I had to over time become good at it and there's some really interesting research by Kate McKenzie Davy who says actually it's quite gendered a lot of women don't like politics they find it distasteful in organizations they say I'm not going to get involved in game playing they take themselves out of it but if you're out of the game you've got no leverage you've got no voice you've got no power and that's and you're going to be overlooked so it's how how can you play the political game without going to the dark side that's really important to me how can you use politics as a force for good and I struggled with that for quite a long time and then eventually found my way to it by thinking about the difference between I used the word authenticity, David, is that piece around authenticity and integrity. If I'm using political tools like building allies um, for a force for good, for the greater good, as opposed for self-interest, that's incredibly valuable. So I could get my head around politics by thinking of it as I use my political skills for a force for good rather than going to the dark side of self-interest. And I kind of made peace with it then because everything happens using levers, understanding where the power sits, understanding where decisions are made. It shifts all the time. I love the quote in the research that says, no one ever tells you the rules of the game or how to be a better player. They really don't. And what they also don't tell you, by the way, is the rules of the game change all the time. They change with new leaders. They change when the organizational macro environment changes constantly. You've got to be really astute to that and you're not always going to get it right. So for me, looking at some of the research by Badley around, you know, balancing integrity and savviness around politics was brilliant for me because initially I was thinking, I don't want to be that person, but actually I needed to be more politically astute to get leverage to get things done for the greater good. So no, no dark side, you know, you've got to stay on the right side for that one. I think that's important. So that was politics for me. And then finally, the third point for me to pick up that resonated with me was around connectedness. And I think that's huge. I think that's both inside of organisations, knowing everyone at the right levels, having great relationships, having that leverage again, it goes back to politics, having your alliances, having insight and knowledge being pushed at you, but also outside the organisation. That's how lucky enough to meet Olukemi, it's the HR leaders group through the CIPD, having a really good um, connected network outside of your organisation, I think is incredibly powerful. Um, the CIPD leaders network meant that throughout the pandemic, had a group of eight of us, HR, HR, HRD CPOs, helping each other through a very difficult time. And, you know, I couldn't have done it without them, to be fair. I've got some really good buddies from it. But having that connectedness internally and externally, who can you go from for help? I always think of them as friendly experts, having a network of friendly experts, um, old bosses, old colleagues, Anyone that can give you help and you can handle it confidentially, you've got to be super careful on what you do and don't share. And that's why small networks with Chatham House rules work really well in the HRD sphere. Suddenly big networks can be a little bit of a problem when you're, you've got quite sensitive information to share. So finally, to sum up, there's three points there that I've gone through that have resonated with me. I've been involved with the Aspiring HRD programme. I was very lucky to have an amazing mentee who I think taught me more than I gave back. So I think I got the better end of the deal, actually, if, I'm, if I can say that. It's been a really interesting programme to be part of with incredible support on it. And I'd encourage anyone listening if they want to get involved to be a mentor, they should. I think um, it's a really powerful thing as part of our community to back. And part of connectedness is very much giving back and feeding your network. 
So I do try to do as much as that. So it'd be great if we could expand it out because there's something brilliant about supporting the next generation coming through, I think. But that's me done. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I think that's so much will have resonated with so many people and I've seen the questions and the comments flying in. So thank you very much for all of you who are putting your questions in the Q&A. Don't worry, there's still time to do so. So do pop them in there. I know our speakers are very inspiring and it, you might forget to ask that burning question, but do try and pop it in if you can. Um, and with that, on to our final panellist, um, Olukemi Chiboda. So Olukemi is a seasoned HR professional. She has experience in lots of different sectors. Um, she's currently Director of People at Langley House Trust. But she is incredibly busy. I don't quite know how she finds the time to do all of this, but she is also a trustee and a non-executive director at Thames Reach Charity and Thames Reach Housing. Um, not content with that, she's also a non-magistrate member of the Judicial Office Advisory Committee and a volunteer enterprise advisor on our very own CIPD and Careers and Enterprise Company programme. She holds an MBA and an MSc in International HR Management and is a Chartered Fellow of the CIPD. As Sarah quite rightly referenced, Olukemi was recently on the programme, she's an alumni from the programme and was mentored by Sarah, so you'll get a sense of that wonderful dynamic, um, I'm sure. But if I can invite you, Olukemi, to um, take us through your journey to leadership. Um, thank you very much, Leah. Hi, everyone. Uh, as uh, Leah said, Director of People at Langley um, House Trust, I'm really pleased to be here to share my journey into the HR director role. I would like to start by saying that for those who are looking to become HR directors, that actually is possible. It doesn't matter for how long you've been trying to get that role or the challenges that you faced. If you want it, then you have every chance of getting it. You've got to settle that within your mind, first of all, and don't let anyone tell you different. That was my starting point. So I spent a number of years, you know, in my last role as a lead HR business partner. And by this time, I had my MBA and professional qualifications and coaching and mentoring with the CIPD and also with the European Mentoring and Coaching Council at qualifications in agile project management, psychometric testing um, level A and B. I also led several projects at work. Um, so I didn't stand still. Uh, but even though my company massively, you know, invested in me and supported me, there was simply no way to progress internally. So naturally, I felt stuck and it was hard. Uh, but one thing I always did do was to keep moving. I knew that I may be running on one spot, but I was gathering momentum. And when the right time finally came, I knew that I would break through and I would get that HRD role that I was targeting. So I never gave up on myself. So please don't give up on yourself. Now, whilst I was in maternity leave in 2019, I had a lot of time to think. And thinking is good because previously I was just ever so busy. I didn't have time to reflect like Professor David was talking about. And I think that was the turning point for me. Creating time for yourself to reflect on where you are and what you, where you want to go will help to bring clarity to your situation. So I worked out that though I was a sound HR practitioner, I wasn't ready for the HRD role. And that's another thing. You must be ready to tell yourself the truth. So what I did was to identify my gaps and then I mapped out a plan on how I was going to expand my experience. So here was the list I came up with. I wanted to get my second master's to expand my skills and research. I thought that was really good for me to have those skills. I already had a postgraduate, so it was easy to get a second master's. And then I went on this spree to get more volunteering opportunities so I could expand my experience. I applied for and I got the following uh, CIPD member to member mentoring program. Um, and I also became an enterprise advisor with the CIPD. And that helped me to work with local schools to help young people to access the world of work. I became a trustee and a non exec with the uh, Tim Street Charity and Tim Street Housing. Um, and also a lead member with the Judicial Office Advisory Committee, recruiting magistrates to the bench. And also I became a coach and mentor for several organizations. Now those engagements, they gave me different things. I was very clear what I was gonna get from each one. So it's broadening my existing skills and developing the ones that I didn't have. They helped me to broaden my network from interacting with young adults to young professionals, uh, to HR pairs, uh, to those in the justice sector, and of course, uh, uh, to those who are also non-execs in the charity sector. I am an introvert. And so these opportunities gave me access to different spaces uh, and also how to exist in those spaces comfortably. Now, they were all voluntary. I wasn't paid, but I was investing in myself. And there is no payment that is greater than that because investing in yourself is the first step to being successful and making an impact in your world. Time-wise, things got easier post-pandemic because most of those interactions then, you know, they became virtual. But I needed something more. And I discovered the CIPD was running the HRD Aspiring Program. I contacted Leah, I didn't know who Leah was, I contacted her. Uh, and I found out I'd missed the very first cohort. 
I had to wait a whole year, but I chased up, I chased up and I made sure that I gave my best uh, through the selection process and I got in, I was so pleased. It was a game changer. The sessions with Professor David were carefully curated for us to learn about the HRD role. It was, it was, it was really great seeing theory come alive through research uh, and the research on if I knew then what I know now, reflections of the HRD internationally that's been referred to today, it was perfect. It became my handbook and my guide. And unlike Sarah, I had that benefit even before getting into the role. So I was like, okay, fine. Experience, they say, is best teacher, but it doesn't have to be your experience. You can learn from other people. And that's exactly what I did. Um, but you see, that research gave me the chance to pause and to take another honest look at myself. Uh, so I could map out what else I needed to do uh, and work on before I got the role. So for me, getting the role was just not the end. It was the process I was going to go through to transform myself that was important. So I prioritized that. And I can only say, honestly say that seven months into my new role, that research actually still resonates with me and I still look at it. Now, each mentee on the program was assigned a mentor. I had Sarah, I'm proud to say I still have Sarah. Um, and, and I must say that it was a fantastic match. And I don't know how Leah does it or did it, but several of my colleagues actually on the program also commented uh, uh, that you know they, they had this incredible experience with, with, with their mentors. Uh, so that's one thing that actually the CIPD did get right. Now, Sarah changed my thinking entirely. Yes, we worked on my CV and all those things that normally you will get a mentor to, to, do, to do with you, but it was so much more. The real change came from our conversations and the window into how Sarah was thinking. I'll share just three of this with you. Sarah asked me and said, what kind of HRD do you want to be? Because there are different kinds of HRDs. Never thought of that. Well, straight away with that hesitation, I said, well, I'd like to be your kind of HRD. Because straight away, I could see that I liked the way that, you know, Sarah was actually doing a HRD role. Another thing about Sarah and I is that you will have noticed we both speak very, very fast. So even, as, even though our sessions are one and a half hours, we cover content like three hours in one and a half hours. That was great. I didn't have to modify myself. It was fantastic. Um, <laughs> so so that, was, that, was, that was the first thing I needed to, to think about. So you think about the kind of HRD that you want to be if you're trying to get that role. Secondly, don't, Sarah said this to me as well, don't worry about not getting roles, despite the fact that you've applied for several. She said, oh, she said she had the same challenge and that her CV never seemed to be able to sell her. What sells her is when she gets into the room and from referrals, and straight away, I felt like, you know, what I was going through, I felt normalized because I realized that there's nothing wrong with me. It's okay. If Sarah can feel like that, that's great. And, and I felt sane. The third thing that Sarah said to me was the HRD role is not going to be all about doing strategy all the time. You have to look at what the business needs, your quick wins, your resources, and then you work from there. And again, that helped me to dispel the purest myth that I had of what the HRD role actually entails. So in summary, I'd like to note five things uh, that I've learned from Professor David, from Sarah, from the HRD Aspiring Program, and from others in my transition uh, into the HRD role. Number one, when you're looking for a role, make sure to find out about your boss, your new boss, potential new boss, the other directors, the culture, and your team. Is the CEO somebody who will support you, uh, that you can look up to, that you can respect? You know, This is key for you to succeed in the role. And with what you know, you can then get ready for the role even before you start. And when you get there, build relationships and importantly with your team too, because you're not gonna be able to deliver without your team. Number two, the HRD role is a lonely one. Trust me, that statement is loaded. Uh, so get your support system in place even before you get the role. Surround yourself with mentors and peers and other HRDs, cheerleaders and contacts from various kinds of expertise. Even though I've completed the HRD program, Sarah still mentors me uh, and I'm proud of that. I'm so grateful you know, that I still have that relationship with Sarah. And it was really helpful working with her to analyze the organization and what I was going into even before I started. Um, and of course, I still have other mentors. The new organization also got me a mentor. And I've got a strong network of family, friends, and peers outside of the business that helped to keep me grounded because that's important. Number three, focus on learning about the business. Move from thinking from HR to business to thinking from business to HR. I prioritized this in my new role. I visited all the locations and quite widely dispersed in the first uh, few months, connecting with people and learning well. I'm still learning about the business. Now, your HR skills may get you the role, but it is your business skills that will help you to keep the role. Nobody really cares about how many HR theories you know. The point is, so what?
you know, why, the impact. And then it's okay not to know everything, but be ready to listen, to learn, and to stay humble so that you can always continue to learn. Number four, and to quote from David, uh, David's research, think politically, act with integrity. Get comfortable with pay, playing politics, but be true to yourself so you can sleep at night. My sleep is very important to me, so it's important that I'm true to myself so I can sleep at night. Um, but learn where the power lies, the drivers, the levers in the organization. Find out who is really who beyond the formal structures of power. Number five, what are you going to prioritize? Because you are not going to be able to do everything. Get ready to ask and fight for resources, but be ready to justify the value that you will create. Learn how to think and talk bottom line, like the finance and operations director's world. Before I became a director of people, my superpower was that I could get anything done. I just had to do longer hours and the work would get completed. I forgot about this research and I tried doing that. It was, it just, it just didn't work. I believe me, I really tried, it didn't work. So my new superpower is enabling, empowering and equipping others to be the best that they want to be. My aim now is to shine through others. They may not be perfect, but neither am I. Practice makes progress so that we work together and then we make progress together. Now you need that approach to be able to create a balance for your whole self, your family and your life. And actually those are the most important things in life, isn't it? Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Olukemi. I mean, I think that is pretty inspiring. I've seen the questions flooding in from the audience. So thank you so much for sharing your insights. I'm now going to try and put as many questions as I can to the panel because I have been coming in thick and fast and, and building on some of the things um, that you all spoke about. Um, but one of the first ones, and I'm going to stay with you if I may, Olukemi, and then potentially come to Sarah on this one. In your opinion, is it easier, this is one of our audience members asking this, to make that transition to an HR director in your current organisation or to break free and do it somewhere else? Olu Kemi, what are your thoughts? I know you've, you've got some, uh, some form and experience in this area. That's a really good question. Um, and I almost, I feel it's like one of those uh, rhetoric questions that actually there is no direct answer or one answer to it. It just really depends on the organization, depends on you, depends on the culture uh, of the organization as well. In fairness, I did want to stay and progress in my organization. I just didn't have the opportunity. Um, and mm. so I knew that actually, unless I was going to kill off my bosses, and I didn't want to do that with really <laughs> people, I knew the only other way was to actually find something externally. But of course, the pros are, there are pros and cons to whatever happens. If you stay on, you, you obviously have the comfort of oh, familiar you know, ground, you know everything, you can just build on what you know already, you know the people, you know the stakeholders, you have the history, you know the legacy and all of that. But then you also have to let people see you differently. So if people are used to seeing you as an operations person, you know, uh, you know, a tactical person, you want to switch to that point, you know, it, it, like like Sarah was talking about, there is that transition, and obviously you have to fight for that. So that's that challenge. Uh, but if you go to another organization as well, yes, you can start on a clean slate. You know, they can see you straight away as a director, but you don't know what you're going there to meet. For instance, um, in this organization, this is the first time they're going to have a director of people role. So even though it wasn't me they saw previously as a tactical person or a head of HR, I still have to make sure that I'm creating that awareness of how a director of people functions and how I work. Uh, so I think you just have to work with whatever life throws you, basically. But you know, whatever opportunity you get and you think is right for you, then you know, work from it. Absolutely. Sarah, did you have anything to add on, on that? I've got another question designed for you, but anything to add there? I would agree with that. I think it depends on the organisation. Previously, as a specialist, I was pigeonholed as a specialist, and that can sometimes make it difficult to move up. Whereas if you've got other organisations have allowed me to move laterally, I moved from doing a sales position, actually, into an internal recruitment position. So it depends on how, how the organisation works and how you're viewed. Is your role seen as siloed? Is it seen as a natural progression. Some organisations are brilliant at talent mobility, other organisations other organizations a bit more siloed. So I think it's mm. very specific to the to the company. Definitely. And, and staying with you, if I may, Sarah, I mean, one of the questions I think we've got from somebody who is a new HRD. So they were sharing that it's very valuable and reassuring to hear and have time to sort of consider some of these reflections. But how do you navigate holding peers and those who are more senior to you to account and, and at the same time retain, you know, strong working relationships with them and beyond any issues? 
I think it starts with um, there's about three or four different steps to go through. The first one is demonstrating mm -hmm. your value, because if you're accountable, it starts with you. If you can be accountable, then you can start holding other people accountable. So you've got to have enough credibility personally and professionally to be holding other people. So it starts with you, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Secondly, it's about getting agreement and consent. You know, you've got to have their agreement really to be agreeing what does accountable look like. So you have to have mm -hmm. to do quite a lot of work. Some some companies are very good at having formal off-site days and, and ways of agreeing code of conduct. So I've often navigated it informally by getting to know my peers, what's important to them, what agendas are they working to, how can I support their agenda? Once I've got that relationship in place, then you can start challenging them. It's hard to challenge without the relationship and trust in place first. So mm -hmm. start with yourself, be credible, and credible in HR comes from delivery. Do I deliver what I say I should deliver? Am I commercial? So start with yourself, then you start building the relationship, and only then can you challenge. If you challenge too early and hold people accountable, you are going to get a kickback. I mean, good luck with that one. Um, I'm very careful. But I think if you start with you, you're credible, you're delivering, you build a relationship up, you know, you kind of help each other out, then you can start um, holding people accountable once that trust and credibility is in place. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. David, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Yes, please do. I'll come on the back of that one. one, one yeah, please. It's been, been fascinating to observe, not just with HRDs, um, <clears throat> but um, the, the new the new director, functional director, um, inst you, you come in and you've got to establish your reputation and, and your, your, your relationship with them. <clears throat> and so, um, challenging them not by directly but by getting them to explain things to you and and, and and asking the questions that reveal the illogicality of what they of what they're proposing and it's that and it's that that sort of constructive dialogue that get that makes them justify themselves but in a nice way it's all about your learning and trying to understand everything that's going but but but, but that's that, that that those penetrative questions are mm. far more effective yeah. Um, uh, I, I, in, 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 so we've observed the net, the, the net, the, the, the direct challenge. And I don't know what, what yeah. Oli came in and, and, and Sarah would respond to that. But I think I've seen lots of nodding heads. And I, David, if I may stay with you, I think um, when Sarah was talking about politics, the Q and A was going um, quite busy, and, and there was a bit of a frenzy there. And I think lots of people would like to have a little bit of a steer on navigating politics. I know it's something you cover in some of the sessions we do, but one person contacted us to say they've been brought in alongside a lot of other new talent to a business in this new role, which is great, but there is still a bit of a hangover of the old toxic culture and some of the existing leaders have remained and bring with them heavy baggage. What's the best way to navigate that sort of toxic environment where it's heavily politicized and perhaps you're starting to question if you've made the right decision in moving over we've just completed and delivered a, a book on on coaching in a politicized environment mm. um, and one of the things we actually have in in, in, in that in which we we're making available to, to this the, the current cohort is a is a questionnaire we've developed in the research on basically how politically savvy are you um, mm. And uh, if anyone would like like a copy of that, then we'd be very happy to to send to send them one. But politics, toxic politics, operates in the shadows. And clarity, bringing it in, into into the opening, open, bringing out the values of the organisation, and, and and actually having constant discussions about the values. And these values not on, on, are not necessarily values are set by HR. They're values set by the organ, the espoused values. So. Um, creating forums where um, uh, you can you can actually have discussions about what well, are we living up to our values in the way that we're approaching this? What's happening here? So the more it comes into into the daylight, the le the, the, the the less power the politically the, the negatively politically motivated people have, and mm -hmm. it's and that's constant um, um, bringing shedding daylight on the issues. In the National Health Service, we've trained over 200 ethical mentors, uh, and these are people that anybody can go to if they've got, if they think that that, that some of the ethical um, values of the organisation are being broken, and ask for, and and, and the, men, the mentors in this case are helping them to think about how they they take that further. So there's lots of things that we can do. I think that just that take it away from the shadows. Yeah, definitely. Um, I love this question. Somebody's put in here which I think is a great question 
how do you know you're ready to be an HRD? I feel like that's the million dollar question. How do you know? So let's start with you, Olakemi. How did you how did you know you were ready to be an HRD? You know, um, it's, it's a fantastic question, isn't it? Because you can you can sometimes think, you know, you're ready for something and then at the back of your mind somewhere you can doubt yourself and think, okay, maybe you're not ready. Um, and I, I would say that with anything, would you ever be completely, completely ready for anything? So don't be put up by the fact that, oh my God, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I can't, you know, there will always be that level of, no matter how ready you are, there's always going to be that level of, you feel the tension, you feel like, Oh, I'll be on my own. I'll be lonely. It'll be all of those things. That doesn't mean that you're not ready. You're the only one that can really decide if you're ready or not, regardless of what anybody else is saying. And from my experience, what I did was I wanted it. So in a way, I felt I was ready. But when I took a step back, looked at the research, engaged with people who were obviously experienced, I came to my personal conclusion that I wasn't ready. Now, that doesn't stop my ambition. I want to do it. And I didn't get frustrated and say, well, I'm not ready, I'm going to give up. No, what that helped me to do was to be able to then sit down, be honest with myself and say, how do I get ready? So I don't think that it's a finite question of how do you know it's ready? I think it's more, how do I get ready? And once you know you've done everything to be able to get, you, you would know, it's like, a, a, you know, Sarah would say to me, when we first started, Sarah didn't say straight away I was ready. You know, went through the CV, she tore apart my CV, then we did this, we did that with her. And afterwards, she was like, you know, and there was, a, I remember a particular session with Sarah, um, and, and she asked me a couple of questions, and it was very interesting. What do you like, British Airways or Virgin? What do you do? And I was telling her my rationale. What do you, you know, we went through all of that, and she looked at me and said, You're ready, you're ready. I know the way Sarah talks very quickly, like I do, you're ready, you're ready. And, you know, for me, that was a confirmation that, okay, fine, let's go out and fight for this role now. So I think it's been, um, you know, honest with yourself. Uh, don't 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 get daunted by the fact that it's a lot, but actually go mm. through that process. How do you get ready is a better question rather than just saying, "Oh, I'm not ready," so I may not be ready. Yeah, definitely. And and Sarah, one of your um, points I think is a really good one, and it's 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 a theme that's come out throughout the aspiring HRD mentoring program. This theme of loneliness in leadership and how vital those networks are, and it's why we try to foster more of a peer community. Um, we've had a question which I think is a really good one. There's there's a plethora of virtual networks out there for HR practice. How do you decide which ones to put your time and effort into um, to to get the best return? Either you can add value or you can take value or both. Mm -hmm. It's just being clear. What, what do you, where, where can you add value? Because sometimes it's about you giving something back and feeding your network. Um, and secondly, it's where can you take value? Um, so I think there's there's a number of different ways you would need value. You need um, networks that are going to be around your profession. Um, you know, for instance, a state agency or law or tech, whatever profession you're in. You've got networks around um, your role, HRD or peer level. And then you've got ones that are communities of practice, like, you know, the CIPD is a broad church with lots of areas in it. So it's looking at what do you need? And that'll change over time. So you might jump in and out of networks, depending on what you need at that point. And I've done that. I've worked in, I've been part of lots of different networks, depending on what I needed. So you can be quite fluid with it. I, I, we've also, I've also set up networks. So when I joined a state agency, my entire network after 20 years in the recruitment industry was very focused in recruitment. I didn't really know many people in the state agency industry. So I actually set up with my one of my old colleagues an HR in a state agency network. So I actually created one because we didn't have one. And that was great. Suddenly we had eight or nine people at HRD, CPO level, all sharing ideas. So you don't just have to join them. You can make them, I think. Hmm. I love that. Um, if there isn't one that suits you, create one. I think that's a great answer. Um, we've got a great question here about imposter syndrome. Um, lots of, of key plaudits, which I'd absolutely echo for the fact that Olukebi and Sarah, you're so inspiring and determined and together about all this. You know, how plagued are you both with imposter syndrome? You know, and how vulnerable can you be with leaders in your current organisations or in other environments like that? Coming to you all first, Olukebi. I, I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, really good question. And, uh, you know, uh, there, there are a couple of things you can do with bear with imposter syndrome. You can dread it and, you know, it gets worse. And you can be afraid of it. But I feed on my fear. I like when it comes, when it hits me as in, oh, you started out yourself. I'm like, look, and I do something visually. So I have different ways of, you know, tackling depending on what the situation is. And I visualize myself sitting down with my feet under the table. And I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. We're going to fix this to get, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to see this through. And, and actually you have, almost have to find a way to be able to wake yourself up and be able to deal with it. I don't have time to start saying, I want to deal with imposter syndrome. I want to deal with the fear. Look, that's fueling the fear of being attention. What I do is to convert that energy, that nervousness, that doubt, I convert it into, okay, 
how am I going to run? I actually get what I want. And by the time I finish getting what I want, I realize, well, actually, that fear isn't there anymore. So that's my own way, uh, because my personality, so that's my way of really dealing with it. But it will come, and it will come at different points. It will come, well, am I going for this role? Uh, am I going enough for, to be at this table? Am I going enough to be on this board? Am I, you know, it will, it will come. Um, and, and actually, you know, like I said, I, I exist in so many different, you know, spaces and, and whatever, so that I could learn, so that I can be comfortable. And, and so, for instance, if I'm with my own new board, I'm not that scared because I'm like, well, I, I sit on two other boards and, you know, this person's probably at that person. That's fine. They don't hate me. They, they, they're, not, they're not really thinking that, you know, I can rationalize it through. And that's, again, is how I work through it. But I would say that don't be put off. Everyone feels a certain level of fear, anxiety. I mean, whatever president or prime minister, Liz Truss probably feels it now that she's standing there looking at all the issues. You know, she's standing there. She's not running. So that's what you got to think about. You will never, ever get to a point in your life or any position where it feels like, oh, it's all over. No, this is just the starting point for everybody. So your, your, your end point might be a starting point for somebody else. It's normal, accept it, deal with it. And Sarah, anything to add? I'd agree with that. Um, you know, I saw an article on LinkedIn saying, if everyone experiences imposter syndrome, is it even a syndrome? Is it just normal, <laughs> it just normal behaviour? Is it just, we can't possibly know everything, that's okay. When I was making the leap from a specialist to a generalist, I reached out to someone in my network who'd done the same thing. He was, he was, he'd started off in L&D and became a very experienced HRD. So I reached out and said, can I buy you a coffee and pick your brains? And I was like saying, oh, what if I get things wrong? And he, his advice was amazing. He said, they've hired you for what you know, not you don't know, stop worrying about it. They've given you a job based on what they, they obviously like you. So stop worrying about it, focus on what you know, fix the gaps another way, but you're fixating on what you don't know. And that's the wrong thing when you're going into a new job. And it really stuck with me, it was helpful. Mm. Absolutely. Can I, can I add to that? So, Please do. I was going to come to the work we've been doing around this. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's a, there's a fine line between imposter syndrome, you know, excessive self doubt, and balanced self doubt. The, the you know the, the criticism, the, the, the kind of criticism that that uh, that that, 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 that Tony, you you did when you evaluated yourself, and actually that fine line you're siding on, you're actually standing on either side of it. Um, as in, in an HRD role, sometimes you move, you find yourself swaying this way, you sway back again. And it's thinking about, about yeah, how am I just going to shift? And it doesn't, it's not a big shift, it's just a, a, a small shift to say, actually, no, I'm applying a balanced self doubt, which means I'm going to be more effective. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm conscious of time and there are still lots of questions. What I would say, there's been lots of interest in the book that you mentioned, David. So if you're comfortable, we will put your email address in the chat so that people can contact you for a copy of that um, and the, take the, that the forward. Book, the book is, out, is at the publisher, so the book's not out yet. But oh, the, OK. But the, sur the, the, um, the survey, yes, um, please do just, uh, just uh, contact me and we will send you a copy of the survey. Brilliant. Um, also, there's been lots of questions in the chat about the aspiring HRD mentoring programme, as you'd expect, because we've had such an inspiring mentee, mentor, and our, our, our learning from David as well. Um, applications will open again in the new year, but I think somebody raised in the question um, and answer box, and this is a true challenge for us. What can we do? And David said at the beginning, our challenge at the CIPD is to broaden out that learning, to share it more widely. So it isn't just the people on programme, it's the wider connections. And I think hopefully what you've taken away from today is there are lots of things you can put in place yourself around creating those networks that are important to support you in what is a lonely transition reaching out to people as Sarah said have a coffee with people understand them as David mentioned you know, become more cognizant with the ways of finances in your organizations you know skill up get ready be ready as Olu Kemi was saying there's lots of inspiring things you can do outside of the program itself and if you are interested in registering or talking to us get in touch with me um, but I, with one minute to go, there's a couple of more things I want to, to say before we round off. Um, obviously, a huge thank you to our panellists, to David Clutterbuck, to Ola Kemi, Jaboda and Sarah Mason for spending this lunchtime with us to bust some myths and actually shed some light on these important issues. There will be lots of follow up. The recording will be available. And I'm, we'll look at other ways to try and get some of this learning out to you um, in the future. So do share that with other people who've missed it. Don't forget to look at our, our well-being resources as well. As I mentioned, these are tricky times, so you know don't traverse them alone. Avail yourselves of the um, support that is out there. Um, 
I did also mention that I was going to talk about the trust and I will. So if you aren't familiar with the trust, our role um, is very much to amplify the charitable purpose of the CIPD. So our focus and our proposition will be on tackling barriers today to create more inclusive workplaces of tomorrow um, by connecting people and organisations with the people, professional expertise that we've been talking about today that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. And you might be thinking, well, how are you going to do that? And the way we're going to do that is by building on the work we've already done to support young job seekers and parents returning to their workplace by connecting them with people professionals to help them navigate that entry or re-entry to work. But we'll be looking at extending that to other groups who might need our help, refugees, prison leavers, for example. Um, in addition, we're going to be building on this, this huge stream of diversifying the profession. Um, the Aspiring HRD programme is one drop in the ocean. It's one programme that we run. We want to take the learnings and, as I said, cascade them further. We want to look at other programmes that will do the same to, to create a more diverse profession that is more representative of the communities in which we operate. Um, and we're also looking at unlocking support at that early entry point into the profession. So we've just relaunched and revamped our bursary scheme to help people who are really struggling with financial hardship to actually um, engage with an HR qualification and kickstart their career into this wonderful profession but if you want to hear more if you want to get involved whether you want to be a mentor as Sarah said or volunteer your professional expertise to help us unpick some thorny issues or maybe you want to come in and co-fund a bursary with us get in touch um, one of my colleagues will put in the chat box or the Q&A box our email address which is CIPD trust team at cipd.co.uk um, but at 101 I know I've gone over by one minute but it's purely because we have such an inspiring panel um, I would like to thank all of them all of you for your fantastic questions and if we haven't come to all of them today we will try and find other ways to answer them do look out for the recording and a massive thank you to all my CIPD colleagues behind the scenes for making it run smoothly particularly Christian Adams so thank you all and hope to see you at a future CIPD webinar very soon. Bye-bye.